Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Martina. And thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to give this uh, last keynote. And what I'd like to do today is to describe some of the efforts in my group toward gaining mechanistic understanding of networks. And I'll specifically focus on the problem of orienting the network, that is learning directions for the edges of the network. And I'll try to describe how the interplay between computer science and uh, biology led us to draft uh, an oriented protein-protein interaction network in you. Uh, so the motivation for our research comes from the need to um, build computational models of the cell that will allow us to simulate them under different conditions and predict the outcome. Uh, the problem is that current experimental techniques uh, can yield only uh, connectivity information between proteins without any functional implication of the measured interactions. So if we are to go from the measured interactions to some mechanistic, for example, a logical model, we need to understand what are the directions in which the signals flow in the network. The problem, as I mentioned, is that uh, directionality is not revealed by a current uh, large-scale de uh, interaction detection methods, which means that we have to infer them uh, computationally uh, using indirect information. So one source of information that people have been using are knockout experiments, in which if you observe that the knockout of a gene S affects the expression level of a gene P, then you assume that there is a path in the network that goes from S to P. So this gives rise to uh, a computational problem of trying to predict the directions in the network in a way that you uh, maximize the agreement with the observed data. So to put this problem more formally, and we call this problem a maximum graph orientation or MGO. So the input is an undirected graph and a list of source target pairs. These represent the knockout in effect. And the goal is to uh, compute an orientation of the network, that is to choose a direction for each one of the edges so that a maximum number of source target pairs have a directed path going from the source to the target. So if you look at the toy example that is shown here, then by orienting all edges from left to right, we are able to satisfy the pairs S1, T1 and S2, T2 uh, when not satisfying the third one. And this orientation is also optimal in the sense that no other orientation uh, can satisfy more pairs. So what I'd like to share with you next is some of our theoretical observations on this problem, which will become important when we try to come up with algorithms for it. Uh, so first of all, uh, an important observation about the problem that helps us to simplify it, which is that if we have a cycle in the network, we can always orient it in a consistent manner, be it clockwise or counterclockwise, and make every vertex on the pathway reachable, or sorry, on the cycle reachable from every other vertex. So this means that we can effectively construct the cycle which means that we can assume that our graph or network is a tree. So even though the, the, the network is a tree, the problem still turns out to be NP-complete. And we can show it by reduction from maximum directed cut, where to make sort of a long story short, given an input directed graph to the max die cut problem, you take its vertices and form from them a star graph in which you connect all of them to a center vertex. And for each original edge of the directed graph, you make a pair, sort of a knockout pair in the reduced graph. And now under this reduction, one can show that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between edges that cross the cut in the original graph and pairs that are satisfied in the reduced graph. And why do I tell you this? Because this reduction tells us two things. It tells us that the problem is already hard uh, on star graphs. 
And second, it tells us that the problem is how to approximate to some constant factor. At the same time, for star graphs, we actually have a very simple algorithm. We can choose the directions on the star uniformly at random. And since every pair is connected by exactly two edges, every pair is satisfied with probability one quarter. And this means by the method of conditional expectation that we can always satisfy on a star graph at least one quarter of the pairs. It turns out that this uh, subroutine can actually um, help us in devising a general approximation algorithm for general trees. And uh, let me tell you how it works. So suppose you are given a tree. In a tree, we can always find a node which is called the centroid that breaks it into smaller pieces. Now, if enough pairs are separated by the centroid, we can sort of treat the tree as a star graph apply our approximation from before and satisfy enough pairs. If not, we can remove the centroid and apply the algorithm recursively on the resulting pieces. And one can show that this uh, algorithm guarantees satisfying a logarithmic fraction of the pairs. And moreover, this result is optimal up to a constant factor. We can further generalize this algorithm to yield uh, a sublogarithmic approximation algorithm for the orientation problem. In practice, though, uh, many hard combinatorial problems admit efficient and exact solutions using integer linear programming techniques. And this is also the case here. So what I'd like to do next is to tell you some of uh, the algorithms that we developed for the problem that actually solve it to optimality and manage to run in seconds or maybe less than seconds on current networks. So the basic formulation that we use is as follows. We introduce two sets of binary variables. One set corresponds to the orientation. So O V W is one if and only if the, the edge should be directed from V to W. The other more interesting set talks about reachabilities. So to check whether there is a path between S and T, we use the fact that in a tree, there's a single path between every pair of vertices, which means that to check if the path is realized, all we have to do is to check whether all the edges along the path, which we know in advance, are oriented in the intended manner. Now, so far, I completely ignore the biology, but there are some biological constraints that we have to take into account when coming up with our algorithm. And one very important constraint is the fact that some of the edges in our network are pre-directed. It could be because we know the direction, for example, for kindness substrate interactions, we always know that the interaction goes from the kindness to the substrate. It could be because these are curated, this is curated information. Now this means that the input graph is not simply an undirected graph, but it's actually a mixed graph. So it contains both directed and undirected edges. For mixed graphs, it seems as though the problem actually becomes harder because for example, the best known approximation algorithm for it is now sublinear and not sublogarithmic. And to give you an intuition why this is the case, know that in mixed graphs, there are cycles that are oriented in an acyclic manner so they cannot be contracted, which means that the graph cannot be reduced to a tree, which again means that for a given pair of vertices, there may be more than one path connecting them. So we cannot use the uh, ILP that I just showed you. However, we can still design an efficient uh, integer linear program for this case by contracting whatever cycles we can and using topological sorting to create a graph of trees that are connected by directed edges, all of them going from left to right. If we create such a graph, then we can work in order on the pieces, on the trees of the graph and get our program. And the key idea in designing this uh, linear program is the fact that we can reduce between three reachability constraints, 
to within tree reachability constraints that we know already how to handle. So to show you why, consider again this toy example here. And you can see that uh, if we are to have a path between A and F, because there's only one directed edge that connects the two trees, then uh, we can reduce this uh, between tree question to the question of whether there is a path between A and B and a path between E to F. So one last technical point that I need to cover before I show you the results of this algorithm, which is uh, even though we can solve the problem to optimality, we may still have uh, multiple optimal solutions. So we need some measure of confidence in our orientations. And the way we, we get this measure of, of confidence is by looking at each edge in turn and trying to see whether forcing its direction to be reversed to what it is in the optimal solution uh, decreases the, the number of pairs that we can satisfy. So if this is the case, if the edge UV in its U to V orientation can satisfy more pairs than, it, than in its V to U orientation, then we say that the edge is oriented with confidence. And now I can give you a taste of the results of this algorithm. So we apply this algorithm to uh, data from yeast. We had 50,000 knockout pairs that come from uh, knockout expression experiments. Uh, we applied to a very reliable network that contained uh, about 8,000 edges, uh, both directed and undirected, as well as 1,300 test edges between kinases and phosphatases to their substrates uh, that we fed to the algorithm uh, as undirected and we use them to test its performance. Now, after the cycle contraction phase, only about 10% of the test edges remain, so 166. And what I show you here is uh, what is the percent of edges that we manage to orient and what is the accuracy that we obtain in this orientation as a function of the percent of uh, pairs that we fed as input to the algorithm. And what you can nicely see is that the more information we give to the algorithm, the higher its performance. So it covers more edges and it's more accurate. And this supports our use of knockout pairs for doing the orientation. Moreover, you can see that when we are uh, at the full information, it reaches quite a high accuracy level of 86%. So this is very satisfying, except for one obvious weakness. And this weakness is the fact that already in the cycle contraction phase, before we even started our ILP, 90% of the edges were eliminated. And the question is, how can we overcome that? And again, here biology comes to the rescue with the realization that real biological pathways are not simply arbitrary path in the network, they tend to be relatively short. And this is also supported by statistics from uh, known pathways in curated databases. So this gives rise to a new variant of the problem in which, which we call the shortest, in which we say that the pair is satisfied if and only if it has a directed path whose length is the shortest possible. So the length of this path should be the length of the shortest path in the original undirected network. Now this problem variant is again, seems to be harder than the previous ones. For example, we can show sublinear hardness of approximation for it. Nevertheless, we can still design an efficient integer linear program for it that runs again in seconds by using the fact that we can efficiently represent all shortest paths between a pair of vertices using a directed subgraph. And given an orientation, we can apply flow computations on this directed subgraph in order to check if, F, if S and T are connected. So this indeed allows us to skip now the, the cycle contraction phase because cycles cannot be contracted anymore because they affect the length of the pathways. And indeed this uh, gives rise to a huge 
increase in our uh, recall, in our coverage from about 10% to about 30% or more. Uh, so this is very good news. However, you can note that still the majority of the edges in the network are not oriented. And this is because the majority of the edges do not lie on shortest path. So to summarize what I've shown you so far, uh, leading or practical approaches for the network orientation problem tend to focus on shortest or near shortest path. And while accurate, they suffer from low coverage. Moreover, everything that I described so far was done in yeast because yeast, as also mentioned by Anastasia yesterday, is the only organism for which we have systematic knockout data. So, if, so going forward, if we are to generalize these ideas to human, these are the two challenges that we have to tackle. We have to overcome the low coverage and we have to find a data source that will replace the knockout data. So let me first touch the coverage problem. And the main idea here is that we should replace these global uh, combinatorial uh, constraints with local edge scores that we can uh, compute for every edge. And to give you an intuition how to compute such scores, let's look at a small scale example that I'm showing here, which is uh, a pathway that is taken from K. What we would like to do if we are to, so, so what I'm showing here, I forgot to mention, is a pathway that is stripped out of its direction, but all directions go from left to right. So if we are to orient some edge, one simple idea for that is to measure the distance between each one of its nodes and the start node of the pathway and orient from the closer to the more distant. However, if we did that, we would again be emphasizing shortest path. So what about replacing this idea with a slightly modified idea in which when computing proximity, we take into account all the pathways in the network. And there is a rigorous way to do that. And this rigorous way, again, was mentioned yesterday, is a network propagation. In network propagation, we, we view a node or a set of nodes for which we want to measure proximity to as, a so as sources of flow. And we let this flow propagate in the network and when the process converges, the amount of flow collected in each node corresponds to its proximity to the source node. So going back to our examples, we can actually run two propagations. One forward propagation from the start of the pathway, one backward propagation in which we reverse all, all directed edges that are in the network from the ends of the pathway. And now we can score every edge by the ratio of the propagations to its nodes on the forward uh, run times the ratio of propagations from the backward run. And it turns out that this scoring scheme is extremely uh, powerful. On this specific example, it yields the correct direction for 48 or 52 interactions. It also greatly outperforms the naive scores that one would use like BFS or DFS visiting time. So did this happen by chance? The answer is no. We checked the five largest CAC pathways, each one containing uh, at least 200 uh, directed interactions. And using this method, we got an average accuracy of 88%. We got even higher accuracies when checking uh, pathways from the NetPath collection. Moreover, we observe that the scores that we give nicely distinguish between edges that should be oriented according to K versus edges that should be left unoriented. So it seems like we overcame the coverage problem. Now what about the data problem? So the only previous method to be applied in human used instead of knockout pairs pairs of uh, membrane receptor and transcription factor. However, uh, the correspondence between receptors and transcription factors is not fully known, and this may bias the orientation. 
So instead, we, what we chose to do in this work, uh, and the mastermind behind this work is my a former PhD student, uh, Dana Silberbuch, we chose to use a other causal data from human. And specifically, we use drug response data in which we observe expression changes of genes in response to drug treatment. And we assume that this is a result of uh, the knockdown of the drug targets. And we also use cancer genomics data in which we observe expression changes in cancer patients. And we assume that at least part of them are due to mutations and copy number aberrations in those patients. Now, each such source of information, so be it a drug or a patient, allows us to uh, score all the edges in the network. So how do we uh, account for all of them together? We simply view them as features and we learn a classifier that learns to automatically weigh them in order to produce the final prediction. So we call this the diffuse to direct or D to D scheme. And let me show you a bit uh, how it works. So the way we evaluate it is using uh, known collections of a, a directed interactions. And we compare ourselves to two approaches, to this previous approach that I told you about by Vinayagam et al. that is based on shortest path from receptors to transcription factors, as well as to a topology-only approach that simply tries to orient edges based on the centrality of their nodes, regardless of causal information. And what you can see here are precision recall plots uh, taken when orienting the network with the drug response data across uh, a wide variety of uh, collections of non-directed interactions. So including a, a signaling interactions, phosphorylation interactions, ubiquitination interactions, and more. And in all these cases, you can see that D2D outperforms uh, the other approaches. Uh, what about uh, the agreement? Oh, sorry, I forgot. Again, one I think to observe is that the more information we feed the method, the better its performance, which again, it supports our use of drug response data in this case uh, for orienting the network. Now, what about the agreement between the different sources of information? It turns out that the sources produce relatively concordant uh, predictions. With the more sources supporting a prediction, the more likely the prediction to be correct. And this allowed us to uh, compute some confidence measure in our uh, predictions and uh, orient with confidence almost 70% of the interactions in the network. Moreover, when we looked at the remaining 30%, we found out that they significantly overlap interactions within known protein complexes that are thought to have a structural role and not to have uh, a specific orientation. Uh, so now after establishing our orientation framework, the big question is, does the oriented network resource leads us to um, better uh, or more meaningful biological predictions? And let me show you two examples from, for that. The first example comes from trying to predict drug targets based on their proximity to uh, genes that change their expression in response to drug treatment. It turns out that when we look for these proximities using the oriented network, then the true targets rank almost 3,000 places higher than when using the unoriented network. And similarly, when trying to uh, predict cancer driver genes based on their proximity within different patients to genes that uh, are differentially expressed in those patients, we find out that the oriented network enriches for known cancer driver genes 
and depletes for no non-drivers. So to summarize, uh, I've shown you a propagation-based method for network orientation, which is based on using drug response and cancer genomics data as surrogates for knockout data. And I've tried to demonstrate that this orientation really improves the predictive value of the network. And there's just one last angle that I would like to cover, which is the one that we actually started the talk with. The fact that, this, that I believe that this oriented uh, network can serve as a starting point for final modeling of cellular process. So how can we go beyond orientation to, to, to final modeling? So one idea appeared already by Ying et al. in 2004, where they suggested that knockout data can be used beyond orientation also to predict size of a repression or activation of edges. So th their idea was that the net effect of a path is the product of a, the signs of a, along its edges. So for example, the net effect of a path from A to Y would be minus, while the net effect from, uh, of a path from X to B would be a uh, plus, would be, an, uh, would be activation. So this again gives rise to a, a combinatorial problem that we are almost familiar with. Can one predict the size in the network in a way that will maximize the number of ex effects that can be explained? And it turns out that this problem is very, very similar to the orientation problem. So again, cycles are ambiguous and can be contracted. And again, because of this uh, observation, we can write uh, at least a basic integer linear program that is very similar to what we saw in the orientation case. However, there is one crucial difference between the two problems. And this difference is that the sign constraint is weaker in the sense that if you have a path, it's enough for us to flip the sign of one edge and we flip the sign of the entire path. While if we have a path and we reverse the direction of one edge, it will not reverse the direction of the entire path unless this path consists of a single edge. So this means that in order to predict signs, we need more restrictive models than what we use for orientation. Just two years ago in ISMB, we actually presented a scheme to predict signs. Uh, so this is a work by a, a PhD student that I worked with, Sushant Patka, who is now at the NCI. And the idea there was that in addition to using the, the ASP, the, the shortest path paradigm, in which we say that the pair is satisfied if it has a shortest path, we also used uh, the notion of all shortest paths. So a pair is satisfied if all shortest paths that connect this pair have the required sign. And also a, a last scheme, which is a directed shortest path, in which we try to both orient and sign the, the path and require a pair to be satisfied if it, if it is both directed uh, correctly and also signed correctly. And again, these models provide different predictions and we uh, integrated all of them together using uh, a classifier. And when we got uh, very promising results uh, in yeast with areas under the curve of around 0.8, uh, it remains an open question, which I really encourage you, the listeners, uh, to tackle how to generalize these ideas to human and how to combine them with the orientation work to create the first fully annotated uh, network model in human. And with that, uh, let me finish by acknowledging uh, my group members. You can see them here before and after the Corona era. So the setting is different, but the smiles remain the same. Let me acknowledge my wonderful collaborators that are mentioned here, and especially uh, Dana Silverbush, who is now a postdoc at the Broad and is behind many of the works that I described. And thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much for the exciting talk. Uh, I see quite some questions pop up, so I think we're just going to start by the most voted question, which is by Wayne Hayes. From a biological perspective, are there any edges that could have opposite directions in different contexts? So I think it's a wonderful question. The plasticity of orientation, and I try to allude to it uh, in one of the slides where I showed how different sources of information give us a concordant yet also different prediction on edge orientations. So I think it's a wonderful open question that should be pursued. Thank you. Um, great results as always. Uh, I was wondering how do you deal with protein complexes? How directions are defined in these instances? So again, a wonderful question, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that, but we do believe that edges within protein complexes should not be directed. And what we found, and I tried to allude to that, is the fact that the 30% of the interactions in the network that we don't manage to orient with confidence significantly overlap with a p-value practically zero, something like 10 to the minus 100, with uh, edges within known complexes. Thanks, that's clear. Uh, Diana has a question uh, um, about uh, the maximizing of the number of connected source target nodes. So you aim to maximize that number. And she asks, why do you expect that such an oriented network uh, corresponds to the most biological meaningful of all oriented networks? So uh, it's a tough question. I think the proof is in the pudding, right? So this is what I used and I get very accurate orientations. Um, so, there, so, you know, it's a data maximization uh, algorithm. We observe knockout pairs. We try to match them as, as good as we can with the orientations, and we get very accurate orientations. Beyond that, I mean, it's of course a question, what is the right model for the data? But we used ours very successfully. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Wilson has a question about the flow-based model and uh, that it's interesting that that was used for orienting the network. So she's wondering what is the minimal amount of information you might need to orient a novel protein-protein interaction network or a network where you either don't have a clear input-output relationship or uh, there are nodes in a network without prior relationships? It's a long question, <laughs> multiple uh, so questions. So without causal information, uh, I will not be able to orient the network. So, so the orientation builds on the fact that we know how the signals flow, right? So we, we don't observe them on the edges, but at least we observe them at large scale across the network. Uh, we must have some input information in order to apply all these methods. Yeah, so the aim is not to predict new relationships, but use the relationships there and orient them. Well, one, so this is a different question. Maybe one can take the oriented network and now try to predict what would be the result of a knockout, for example. And I think this could be very successful. Uh, so, for example, when we try to predict drug targets, it's exactly knowing what is the endpoint of the response, and we are trying to predict what is the source of the response. So, in that, we could be successful, right? Uh, so, if we adapt our current orientation and we try to make these predictions uh, for either end of the response, then uh, I try to give some evidence that this could be successful. Thank you. Um, then we have a question about disease specificity. So can we construct the disease specific oriented TPIs based on this method? So the answer is yes, right? So if our uh, uh, causal information is taken from a specific disease, 
uh, then the orientation will reflect the biology of the disease. Uh, and again, you can see in the slide that I'm showing now that we actually oriented the network uh, using different cancer types in this case. And we got relatively concordant uh, orientations, but also some differences that reflect the biology of the disease. Very nice, yeah. Um, there's a follow-up question about the complexes. So do you always try to reduce the dimension of network with first clustering and then consider all clusters, so which are complexes, as one node and then predict the direction between them? And if you think this will work. Yeah, we don't. We don't try to do that. Uh, simply because our method is fast enough that we can apply it on the grant team. We don't need to reduce it. Uh, but uh, if we knew that all edges that are within complexes are really not oriented, then we could make this shortcut and contract them and then run the algorithm on this contracted network. We don't do that. Yeah. How large are the networks that you tried this method on? So what was the largest network you tried to run it on? So the human network, I think, was around uh, 200,000 interactions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't, re I don't recall the exact number. Yeah. Maybe 150. So, I mean, we just took the network from BioGrid. So uh, whatever it its size was in in 2019 was the size of our network. Yeah, great. Uh, one last question, live maybe. Um, how well this, does this apply to multivariate phenotypic data where each knockout has multiple features? I'm not sure I understand what it means each knockout has multiple features, but, uh, but I think that I gave an answer when I showed the small scale example of a cake pathway. So in the cake pathway, we have sort of the, 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 the ends of the pathway are these, I guess, uh, multiple features. And we simply consider them as one big node and we run the network propagation and it measures the proximity of every other node to them. And there is no problem with that. So it generalizes very nicely. Very nice. Um, there is, I think, one more question that maybe you can answer um, in the in the Q and A dialogue. Uh, so we can start with the next chat uh, talk. And also, uh, some people were wondering if you would join the cafe during the break, so they have a chance to chat. 